Welcome to the Ultimate Music Teacher's Productivity and Profitability Podcast. I'm your host, Glory St. Germain. Tune in to discover how you can unleash your teaching potential and turn your passion for music education into profit. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Ultimate Music Teacher's Productivity and Profitability Podcast. I'm your host, Glory St. Germain, and today I have the absolute pleasure of introducing a dynamo in the world of music education, the woman who believes that laughter is the best pedagogical tool and sees music as a vibrant tapestry woven from diverse threads of creativity, improvisation, composition, and yes, games. Here she is, the piano teacher, prolific blogger, and the resourceful creator we all adore, Nicola Canton. Welcome to the show, Nicola. Oh my gosh, it's so great to be here. And thank you for that lovely introduction. That was charming. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So Nicola, let's just dive right in. From your blog to the practice app, you seem to be everywhere. And all these diverse projects, how do you ensure that the core message of inclusivity remains a shining beacon? Yeah, I mean, I try to bring that through everything I do. And I'll just explain a little bit, I guess, about what I mean by inclusivity, because sometimes that's a bit of a buzzword. Yes. And I'm really trying to embody it in what we're doing in the broadest sense of the word. So I mean, yes, including students who are neurodivergent or have special needs or additional needs and including people from all backgrounds and all cultures. But I also mean, let's include the kids of parents who didn't study music, like things as small as that, which seem like, oh yeah, well, they'll be fine. No, they're not fine. Most of the time, those kids end up quitting. The students who stick with us often, from my experience and from seeing other studios, are the ones whose parents did study music because there are all these kind of givens that we just assume they're going to know, and they don't. They don't know about practice or they don't know about the home instrument and then they slowly drop off. So I'm trying to bring music to more different types of people. And yeah, that shows up in every part of what I do from things like the practice app, which is trying to bring research-based practice strategies to students, as well as helping teachers with their organization. Because again, those things aren't just natural. They're not instinctive. They're not common sense is not common, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to build those skills in students. That's part of it. The games are a big part of it because that opens the world of music up to so many more students than sitting down and doing written theory, which is a great compliment to that as well, but broadening it out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, kind of, I hope it filters through pretty much everything I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. I mean, congratulations on your success. You know, I've followed you for many years and of course we've spoken multiple times, but it's just so impactful when you lead music educators in such a positive way. And you mentioned that embracing technology is crucial for the future of music education. Can you maybe share some examples of how technology has positively impacted your teaching or, you know, the teaching of others? Yeah, absolutely. I think I've heard this more and more in the last few years, even from teachers that they have this, basically technology has become this big bad wolf, as in they're scared of YouTube or apps or AI or something taking their job, right? Yes. And I think the answer to that, in most cases, when any technology feels like it's coming for you, whether that was way back when, you know, the spinning jenny was taking over (laughs) the whole factory world or on from there. When those things are coming for you, the solution isn't to put a spanner into the machine. It's not to fight against it. It's to embrace it and use it in your studio, because that's how you stay relevant and stay on top of it. So the big one that teachers are feeling a lot at the moment is just YouTube tutorials. You know, students go to YouTube and teachers are feeling like, well, they're going to feel like they don't need a teacher. We know they still need a teacher because you teach you technique or really how to read music or so many other things. But teachers are afraid that students won't know that. And so they'll stick with YouTube. And that's not been my, my experience. I've had a lot of YouTube transfers. Mm -hmm. who they get a little bit of the way with YouTube and then they figure out, hey, there's something missing here. I can't do this. And they seek out a teacher. Now, when they take that step to seek out a teacher, if that teacher says, oh, don't ever touch YouTube again, that's taboo. 
Like you can't bring that in here. You can't learn any of the songs that you were learning on YouTube. You can't do pop music. You can't improvise. Yeah. Whatever they were learning to do. Well, then the student may turn away from that again and say, oh, well, this isn't the type of piano I want. But mm -hmm. if we say, oh, cool, what did you learn on YouTube? Oh, let me show you what the sheet music looks like for that so you can see the patterns or see where the repeats are, right? Yes. And we connect the dots for them. So I think it's all about embracing the change as hard as that is for all humans to do. You know, I'm not immune to it. Everyone finds change difficult. Yes. But trying to take that on board, learn from what your students are learning and the technology they're using and don't try and push it out of your studio instead of bring it in. Yeah, but it's so well said, Nicola. And I think also it's about building relationships with your students and and being curious about how did they learn that? Maybe you're maybe you're amazed by what they've learned, but I think the beauty of then them searching you out as an educator, because you know, watching something on YouTube is one thing, but if you want to ask a question, then you want to connect with your teacher who can probably help you get there faster. So, you know, one of the things that we often talk about is the topic of inflation, and it's kind of the elephant in the room sometimes in many teaching studios. What's your advice for teachers kind of grappling with the idea of pricing and its potential impact on their business? Yeah, you know, teachers are in general, the kindest people. Yes, I <laughs> one agree. Of the things, one of the things about running an online business, and if you like listen to things about online business generally advice, you'll hear a lot of talk about like haters or negative comments or whatever. And that's not my experience at all because I work with teachers and they're all yeah. so lovely. Yes, but I agree. <laughs> one of the downsides of that loveliness and wanting to help people so much is that teachers can often be scared or reticent to ask for something that they need. Yeah. So because the families are hurting and you care about the families and the fact that they're dealing with inflation, you feel like you shouldn't raise your rates because you're going to make the problem worse. Yeah. But the thing is, inflation is also hitting you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't look after your own studio first, your own business, yeah. well, then at worst case scenario, the business is going to sink. You're not going to be able to teach anymore. And yeah. then how are you helping these families? Mm -hmm. So you really do have to look after your own ship first and that's your business. You have to keep it afloat. Yeah. yeah. Because if we don't keep up with inflation, we're losing money every year. And at some point we're going to, yeah, either go under or get resentful of the time we're putting into the teaching just because mm -hmm. we're not being paid fairly for it. So yeah. As painful as it might be, know that you're doing it for everyone's good as well. It's yeah. so that you keep your business flowing. It's so that you can still invest in professional development and be the great teacher that you want to be. Yeah, hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think too, sometimes, as you said, they're so kind and compassionate and sure I can do makeup lessons and sure I can do this and rearrange my entire life to accommodate you. And one of the things that you mentioned was just the, the bargain basement pricing that really piqued my interest. So how do you think it poses a threat to our industry? Like how can educators kind of counteract this? Yeah. You know, you see this a lot when you work with different teachers from different countries and we conduct yeah. a big survey every couple of years of teachers where we kind of compare different countries mm -hmm. and you see this a lot from the perspectives in those places so I won't mention anywhere in particular but I'll talk to a teacher who's in a part of the world where pricing for lessons is just a standard really low and the cost of living is not yeah. you know in line with that it's just happened that teaching piano lessons have come to be seen this way and right. that happens through lots of different teachers complying to this norm right right and it becomes very difficult to change so when one teacher is bringing things down and I have heard from teachers who say well yes but this isn't my family's main income like I really just mm -hmm. do this as a hobby that's fair enough you still should be paid fairly for that yes, time I'm not saying absolutely. everyone has to be a full-time teacher or run some big business you can have three students, but they should sh still be charged at a ra rate that's, you know, in line with your experience and makes sense for your area. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you really are pulling down the market value and it goes down and down and down. Yeah. And teachers don't, shouldn't be, in my view, competing with each other. Even if you're local, it might feel yeah. like we're in competition with them. You're not in competition with other piano teachers or other music teachers. You're in competition with other activities that students do or yes. the Xbox or yeah. 
increased homework loads or something else, you know, or YouTube, like we were talking about before. Yeah. The other teachers in your community, you can bolster each other. You can you can move the whole industry in your area up if we don't 100%. get into some kind of price war. Yeah, hundred percent. It's I'm glad you mentioned that about music teachers because in my area, there are three music teachers, and within walking distance, and we are all best friends, and we have been best friends for like thirty years, and when we are uh, scheduling our students. We actually have a little get together and we do one open house. We've often done, done it here at my music studio and all three of our us as teachers are here. We have our schedules here and sometimes it will be super convenient for a parent to say, Glory, you know, can you take my older one? Lorene, can you take this one? Judy, can you take this one? I've got three kids. I can drop them off like within two seconds. They all have their music lessons for an hour. I pick them up and I'm done. Wow, that's incredible. Or sometimes we've even traded students for whatever reason, but we are best friends and never has there been a competition like, well, I want more, but I'll tell you the secret sauce. We also, all the three of us set our rates exactly the same. So there's no mm -hmm. competing like, well, why is she $5 cheaper? So I think it's important to embrace who's in your community, maybe get together, have coffee talk, right? And and say, what are you doing? And, and that's important because you're right. If one person is so cheap, everyone thinks, oh, I'll just go there. But it's not about, about being cheap. It's about being a great teacher and collaborating and learning. And, you know, it kind of brings me to a big question for you. Who doesn't love a good origin story? So tell us about your journey into teaching. Was there like a particular eureka moment when you realized, you know what, this is my calling? What did that look like for you, Nicola? Oh, my journey into teaching is, some might say, an unusual journey to get to teaching. Although from talking to many teachers over the years, it's actually almost more usual to have an unusual path. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Like, I feel like I almost talk to, or at least it's 50-50 of teachers who yeah. say, well, actually, I did a bit of this first and a bit of that. Yeah. So I started teaching around age 15. Mm -hmm. That's pretty common yeah. here in Ireland and in several parts of the world. In some parts of the world, they're like, what? Yes. <laughs> to do that. But I mean, it's pretty common. When I was around 15, my teacher at the time said to me, oh, I was around 15 when I started teaching. You should think about it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was enough for me to say, oh, well, if she says I can do it, I guess I can. So I went out and I started teaching. You know, I had a few students. I cycled to their houses, all that stuff. And that went on for several years. I didn't go to college to study music. I studied art and then fashion design. Nice. So I kept teaching piano all the way through there. It was my part-time job. You know, it was better than most part-time jobs, but I never really thought it was going to be my career. It was yeah. just much better than, you know, being a, a waiter or something like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I graduated from fashion college, went to work in the industry, stopped teaching at that stage for a year came out of that job and became self-employed because I was going to, I, I mean, I did start my own business making bridal wear. Nice. So that's what I went into. <laughs> and alongside that, I was doing some pattern making work. And I also took on some piano teaching because as many people know, when you're first self-employed, you need to find different ways to bring in income. Yes. And yeah, when I started piano teaching after that year off, I really had a new perspective on it. And I started doing things like Googling things, which wasn't a thing when I had started right. quite a bit before that. But, you know, after college, Google was a thing and I was looking things up and I discovered that there were teaching blogs and you could use games to teach. And I started getting really into it, then started sharing my own games that I was creating to help me teach preschool students. And it kind of snowballed from there. And I discovered that my hobby, which was piano teaching, and my career, which was fashion, needed to swap. So I still sew things for myself for fun. Yeah. <laughs> but now piano teaching became my main thing. And obviously it spiraled from there, from the blog and into the membership and beyond. But yeah. that's where it all started. 
Wow. And I, I love the pictures of you at the sewing machine and, you know, creating all of these things. And it's just such an interesting thing. And when you talk about, you know, how you started teaching and why I started teaching at 16 years old. And the only reason I started teaching was because I wanted to buy a car and I would make five times more money teaching piano than my little friend who was working at the Dairy Queen. <laughs> so, But, you know, you fall in love with that. And then, you know, the rest is history, as they say. And you mentioned that one of your piano teachers played a pivotal role in your career. And if she was listening to the podcast right now, what would you want to tell her? Well, all three of my piano teachers (laughs) played a pivotal role in different ways. My first one, because she's the kind of teacher I don't want to be. So obviously I won't mention her specifically, but <laughs> my, first teacher, one of those. Yes. <laughs> my first teacher was, you know, we didn't get along that well. And fair enough, I didn't practice, et cetera. But yes. <laughs> my second teacher, who I transferred to at about age 11, 10 or 11, she was just incredibly kind and that made all the difference. Just that she was kind and she kind of had faith in me. Like when I came in, she thought I was quite good and that I knew things and she had a lot of trust in what I was able to do. And even when I first came to her, I had I had taken one exam with my previous teacher, but had kind of not been on the exam train. And I'd taken the primary grade, which comes just before grade one for us. Yeah. And then this new teacher I went to said, oh my gosh, you should be on grade three, you know, <laughs> yeah. just kind of jumped me ahead. And that was, that experience was enough to say, oh, maybe I'm not terrible at this piano thing. Maybe I can do this. Yeah. She's also the one that suggested I started teaching. Yeah. And then I moved on from her to a more, I'd say thorough teacher, more advanced teacher for, for the last few years of my studies. But yeah, that teacher, my middle teacher, as it were, She made all the difference because she just trusted that I was smart and treated me like, not like a grown up exactly, but like an equal in conversation. You know, she would chat to me. She was only probably eight or nine years older than me, which I think made a difference in that. And yeah, just inspired me to keep going, really. Yeah. And it's so, you know, it's so unique that we as music educators have this amazing opportunity to spend years with the same student, unlike most students that go to school and you have a student in grade eight and then you go into grade nine and then you go into grade and it's always the teachers are changing and not only every year, but even every subject, your teachers are changing sometimes in in schools and universities. And those relationships are so powerful. Like as educators, we do have a, a really unique impact on guiding our students with the words that we choose and and how we navigate them and support them. So it's wonderful that you had those incredible experiences. And so let's do a little a little uh, twist here. In your early teaching days, <laughs> was there ever a time that was either comical or or slightly embarrassing that still brings a chuckle when you think about it? Oh, there are many times that I look back on and say, "What were you doing?" Because yeah. I really had no training. I mean. I say it's pretty normal for a teenager to go ahead and start teaching. Yeah. Maybe it shouldn't be, maybe it should. It's it's not really, it's hard for me to judge since I came through it. Yeah. But I definitely was not the most amazing teacher to my first few students. I was always kind and nice and got on with them. So I did have those properties of my second teacher. But yeah, there were many moments. I'd say the one that stands out just as we're talking <laughs> was... So one of my early students, I think probably student number three or four, he started on a keyboard and it was unweighted. And I remember suggesting to the parent, you know, but I was like 16 or whatever. So yeah, <laughs> I remember suggesting to her, oh, you know, this really it should be upgraded or you should think about getting a piano. But I didn't push it very much. Definitely right. not in the way that I would now. And so he continued on that. I think for two years, one and a half or two years of on this keyboard. And then they finally got a piano and he nearly quit. He transferred to the piano and because I was going to their home, he had never played on a piano, right? Oh. So he literally, he only played on this unweighted keyboard. I think it was full size. Like it wasn't the worst thing ever, but it was unweighted, the keys. So he transferred to the piano and it was so hard 
so difficult to push the keys down. He very, very nearly quit at that point. We managed to get through it, but I look back on that. I'm like, oh my gosh, the grief we could have saved if we just started with the piano, you know? Just yes. insisted. It doesn't have to be an acoustic piano, but it does have to be a weighted case. Yeah, 100%, because it feels so different, right? Mm. I remember when my daughter was preparing for a piano exam and I took her to a local Yamaha music store where they have like whatever, 85 grand pianos in the in the studio. And I made her play her pieces on every single piano because it's different, right? The action is different. And so anyway, I think it put her on on the path to to hit the stage without fear because she was so like, what are we doing today? Oh, right. We're going to practice at the Yamaha store, right? So I would just kind of throw them out there. But yeah, so now I, I'm sure you say, and you do need weighted keys when you're practicing because it's a lot different, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, they need to get a, an appropriate instrument right from the beginning. On your point as well, going to the store, I think that's a great option. I have five basically different piano, no, six different digital and, and acoustic pianos in my house. So yeah. when my yeah. students are preparing for some big event, I take them on a tour of the house yeah. and they play their pieces on every single instrument to say, OK, yeah. we have no idea what it's going to feel like, but let's be comfortable doing it anywhere. Yeah, because I mean, here's the truth. If you're if you play guitar or a saxophone, you you know, you play your instrument, you bring it with you. It's so comfortable when you go to perform or uh, go to an exam or, or a recital or even your grandma, grandpa's house, wherever. All of a sudden you're playing on a completely different instrument. You don't know if it's in tune. You don't know if what the action is going to be, if the pedal is working. So it can be a challenge. And one of the things that we often think about, I mean, the world of music is so vast and diverse. How do you choose which genre or style to introduce to your students? Like, especially when you're integrating improvisation and composition. How do I choose which genre for their written music or for improv yes. specifically? Yeah, let's talk about improvisation and composition. Like, how do you choose which which genre you're going to start with? Yeah, so for me, improvisation is a tool, not to... Like for any jazz musicians listening, you might want to just like tune out for a minute. (laughs) But for me, where I love to use improvisation is as a tool for teaching, which simultaneously exposes my students to the fact that we can improvise. We can make student, we can make music up on the go and we can form it in these different ways. So I started with a very, you know, simple format of just me playing a few chords, basically a simple chord progression and them improvising. Mm -hmm. And I use it as a tool to teach scales or talk about steps versus skips or whatever we're talking about at that moment. So I really start from that and that's where I form the improv from. I'd say if it, if it's any particular style, it's probably more pop style because I try to make it fit in with my students kind of vocabulary of music Mm -hmm. that they understand because then they're going to be able to play along with it more easily. So I generally start with with something that's roughly a pop style and then we branch out from there and we try different things. But as they come up, like if they encounter Alberti bass, we're going to improvise with that. Right. Yeah. And then the composition thing is interesting because it kind of changes every year. So we do a big composition project every year and I pick a different theme for that. So it really depends what kind of music we're making based on that. And they'll draw inspiration from their different pieces and stuff. But like last year, it was all pop songs because we did this particular, like it was all pop songs that they were writing words and lyrics for and everything like that. But often the style of the pieces in those books is very varied. So students follow their whims. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like such a fun thing to do, like just to have themes. And I think one of the things, you know, we talk about our our teachers and for myself, I really missed having that creativity as part of my learning. Kind of feel like I got gypped a little because it was so classically based Mm -hmm. that, I mean, of course I did my own thing and played pop, but I didn't have the leadership that you provide in embracing that opportunity with students. So maybe it's not too late. (laughs) Absolutely. I don't think it's ever too late. Okay, I'll give it a try. (laughs) So as educators, of course, we're all lifelong learners. I'm still learning to this day. What's one thing that you recently learned or discovered, you know, musically or otherwise that kind of surprised you or delighted you? Yeah, 
I'll tell you a little story. This is just a little nugget, but I think it has a bigger lesson to it. So I was recently at the Alberta Piano Teachers Association conference and a teacher told me about a student she had who was in the lesson and suddenly had this like eureka moment. She just went, oh my gosh. And she said, what? And they said, the notes here are the same as the recorder notes. As in, they were doing recorder in school. And she had finally twigged, oh my gosh, the treble clef is still the treble clef. Oh my. Like, this isn't independent. But I think the greater lesson in that is we never know what way our students are seeing the world. Yeah. And to them, recorder class and piano class, if they're six or whatever, yeah. are not both music class. They're like separate classes and they're as interrelated as science and history to mm -hmm. them. Right. So they need more explicit explanations often than we give, right? So yeah. we can't always predict that they're not going to see that the treble clef is the same thing in both places. Yeah. But keeping ourselves open to we don't know what they're not, what they don't know, what they're not seeing. Yeah. And yeah, that was just a comical illustration of that. Oh, that's so funny. So when we before we wrap up, Nicola, because you love to play games, we're gonna play a quick game. You ready? <laughs> okay, I'll do my best. Put you on the spot. So I'm going to name three musical terms, and I'd love for you to come up with a little whimsical or humorous definition for each one. Three three words. And they are legato, fortissimo, and glissando. So what would be your funny or thought-provoking uh, definition of legato? So if it didn't mean what it actually means or yeah. a way to remember what it does mean? Either way, what would you <laughs> just come up with to make something funny up? Yeah. So, I mean, the obvious one to connect it to its actual definition is that your leg and your toe are connected right all the way through. So <laughs> that's one we often come up with. But what could legato mean if it didn't mean legato? Hmm. I mean, I think it has to be to do with the leg. So maybe it's a march in our alternate universe because it's like a leg. Because it kind of, if we say it in a different tone of voice, leg, uh, toe, right? It could be a much more marching okay. type yeah. of movement. Yes. So, okay. Look out. Fortissimo. Fortissimo. Well, we'd have to come back to the fort, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So it's a fortress of Isimo. What could Isimo mean? A fortress of mustaches because of the mo. It's a fortress of mustaches. That's what it means. Okay. I can't wait for you to come up with a game. <laughs> so, and final term, glissando. Glissando. What does gliss sound like? It sounds like bliss, right? Yeah. So... Yeah, it's a, a blissful improvisation. How about that? That sounds great. And I think when we often make up things and then take those silly definitions that you gave, but then you can also turn that into a memorable, you know, vision, like you said, fortissimo. And just when you said the fort and then isimo, like even grandeur. And now I'm thinking, well, isn't that fortissimo with the volume and this, you know, orchestra or whatever comes. So one of the things that I had to do when I was remembering, like learning all my terms was just word associations. Like what can help me remember things, right? So you win virtual cup of coffee and a hug. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for playing. And thank you for joining us today, Nicola. Your passion and dedication and your zest for music education, it truly inspires us. And here's to making musical minds shine brighter and laugh louder. So Nicola, how can people connect with you and learn more about your program? Yeah, so our membership is Vibrant Music Teaching. The app I briefly mentioned that we just launched is called Vivid Practice. That's where you can find those. You can also just look up my name or Colourful Keys, spelled the UK way, so with the extra U. Colourful okay. Keys is where you'll find us on all the social media. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I'll be sure to put all of those links in the show notes as well. So thanks again, Nicola. And to all our listeners out there, remember to stay tuned for more incredible episodes of the Ultimate Music Teachers Productivity and Profitability Podcast. 
If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe, share, comment, and join our Ultimate Music Teachers community. Till next time, keep playing the music. (laughs) Bye now. Thanks for listening to the Ultimate Music Teachers Productivity and Profitability Podcast. Together, we can transform lives through the power of music education. I invite you to explore what's possible for your musical journey inside our UMT community. Simply join our Ultimate Music Teachers private Facebook group where we network, answer questions, host live events, and connect on a deeper level. Here's to your ultimate music teaching success with productivity and profitability. Till next time, teach with passion.